My name is Magnus Hagender. Uh, I'm a Postgres core team member. Uh, I'm a, uh, one of the committers who commit the actual code. Uh, I don't write as much of it as I'd like to. In fact, I don't commit as much of it as I'd like to either. Uh, <clears throat> but at least I'm one of the team that does that. Uh, I do a lot of work for Postgres Europe uh, as well. Uh, that's sort of my community side of my Postgres involvement. On the professional side, I am a Postgres consultant at a company called Red Pill Linpro, which most of you have probably never heard of unless you've been to one of my presentations before. Uh, we're active in the Nordic region, uh, and more or less only in the Nordic region. Uh, I'm based in Stockholm in Sweden myself. So yeah, if I ran into one of you there, that would surprise me. I think I'm the only one from there. Well, you don't count, Robert. <coughs> there you go. Uh, there you go. That's fine. I haven't run into you, though. Uh, <coughs> so anyway, I'm here to talk to you about Postgres 9.4, which will you know, hopefully be uh, released really soon. Uh, let me start with a small poll. How many of you read uh, the Planet Postgres, planet.postgres.org site? Okay, you may not actually need to be here. Uh, for the rest of you, you should read Planet Postgres, just in general. Uh, <coughs> you should still come to my presentation, of course, but Planet Postgres is the blog aggregator that will aggregate a lot of people uh, blogging about Postgres. Uh, and there's a number of people who tend to do a lot of blogging about what's coming in the next version. Uh, in particular, you know, let me extend my thanks to uh, Hubert uh, Depeche, uh, Michael Paquier, and a few others who have basically, as soon as someone committed a new interesting feature to what it was about to become Postgres 9.4, as soon as it was committed, you just waited you know, 30 minutes or so, and there was a blog post about how to use it. And then you take that blog post and you take just the title, and now you have your slides for a presentation like this. <laughs> so they, they helped me with, out with a lot of my work. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but they did help out a lot with it. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the people who actually built all these awesome new features and then bug fixed their own features um, because you know that's what happened, or bug fixed my features. Uh, so for those of you who are not fully set uh, on how the Postgres development cycle works, we typically work on approximately a yearly cycle. Uh, we use something that we call commit fests which is just because everybody has to have their own name for something that's more or less the same. But the general idea is we spend a month doing development, then we spend a month reviewing and committing patches that came out of that development. That's what we call a commit fest. And then we repeat that cycle. Uh, in the current uh, cycle, it's, uh, we repeat it four times, which brings us up to eight months. And the remaining uh, four months we use for testing. So uh, 9.4 was uh, branched off, or actually what happens in Postgres is 9.3 which was branched off and the master branch, the main branch, became 9.4 on June 14th last year. And we started doing the actual development of the first commit fest of backed up patches in June. Now we had another one in September, we had another one in November, we in theory had the last one in January. Now the one in January never is just the one month because this is the last one, this is the last chance to get things into the version in question. So uh, I think that one went on until March, something like that, so two and a half months, maybe even three instead of one. Uh, but we got there. In uh, July, we released the second beta version, which is the current beta version. Uh, how many in here have installed 9.4 beta 1 or beta 2 at this point? In production? <laughs> OK, not even Robert. <laughs> That's weak, man. <laughs> Uh, so that's where we are at right now. Uh, we're in beta testing, so please help us out. For all those of you who did not put your hand up, please go install it. See if it works. If it doesn't, please let us know so we can fix that quickly. If you have you know, test suites for your application, please install 9.4 beta to run your own tests. See if they work. If they don't, you know, yeah, you have to figure out if it's your fault or if it's Postgres's fault, but still, the earlier we can get these uh, reports on things that we broke, because you always break something in application land. Even if we try not to, there's always something. The sooner we can know that, the sooner we can fix it, and hopefully we can get it fixed before release. Uh, the way it looks right now is there is likely going to be, or there is going to be, at least one more beta version. The original plan had the release around right now, or maybe last week. Uh, there are a few things that we do need. We have some changes already made. We have a few more changes that need to be done before we can actually turn this into a release. So it will be a few more weeks. Uh, hopefully, we'll get a new beta version out. Uh, someone's going to hold me to this if I actually give you a date, right? 
<clears throat> let me say, hopefully, September. That'll be vague enough. Definitely October, right? Uh, we have a few minor things. In particular, there's one big thing about the new uh, JSON data type work that I'm sure you've all heard of already and we'll hear more about through these two days that needs to be cleaned up and fixed before we release. Because once we release, we can't change it anymore. Well, we can change some things, but there are certain things that we cannot change. In particular, things like how data is actually stored on disk. We can't change that once you start putting real data into the database. You probably want to be able to read it back again later. If not, maybe you don't need Postgres. Uh, <clears throat> I always do a couple of statistics in this one that I always do. Uh, these statistics aren't actually fully updated. These were updated as of beta 1. Uh, the 9.4 version contains changes to the round number of 2,222 files, uh, 131,000 insertion and 60,000 or so deletion. And we all know that you know, measuring lines of code is the best way of measuring developer productivity. <laughs> this really good. It's, let's say it's, it's a lower number than 9.3. 9.3 actually had a lower number than 9.2. Uh, so we're on, way, on the way down. That doesn't really mean anything, does it? It's just sort of a note that, yes, there's quite a lot of work on it. These statistics also don't tell you how many times an individual line has been changed. You know, we reiterate over features for a long time. It can come in and go and then come back and things like that. Uh, but just as sort of a general idea of how much things have actually changed uh, in what's 9.4. Um, so what's really new? Uh, it's always hard to categorize this. We, we have the same thing, like when we plan a conference, you go like, oh, so we've got to split it up into DBA and developer. Where the is the difference between DBA and developer, really? Hopefully, it's a very, very blurry line. If it's a very strict line and you live in separate buildings and things, your organization has a problem. Uh, but I've tried to categorize this a little bit in sort of developer and SQL features, which are more you know, features that those of you who build applications using Postgres uh, will be exposed directly to. We have some pure infrastructure changes. Uh, we have some sort of DBA administration things and, of course, some replication of recovery. Uh, we had very few changes in that. In some versions, we're back to having changes. And for those of you who went to Simon's talk, for example, you can see there's a lot of things happening in these areas again. Um, <clears throat> so let's take a look at a few of these things. I'm not going to go through every single thing because I have to go home on Sunday. Uh, but a few of the more noticeable uh, and a few of the maybe smaller that you'll uh, notice eventually on the developer and SQL side. Uh, we have some smaller changes on our aggregate side. Uh, for those of you who build custom aggregates, you can now create variadic aggregates. So aggregates that takes a variable number of arguments. I don't think we're entirely sure that this is a good idea. Uh, there's a reason we don't ship any of them in the system in the beginning, but uh, the general consensus was, well, if you guys can actually think of a good reason, then you know, go ahead and shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, there are plenty of strange things you can do with it, but the support is there, and if you have one of the use cases where it does actually make sense, well, now you can do it. Uh, we have some simple things like an improved explain information for aggregates. You can see there's the line here that says, you know, the grouping key. Now, for a simple query like this, which is basically select something from a table group by A, that doesn't really give you much. But if you have a complex, deep explain tree with many, many nodes in it, you can figure out which group by is actually where. Otherwise, you could just say, oh, it's doing an aggregate, but what's it actually aggregating here? This will tell you exactly uh, what is happening at which point. Uh, <clears throat> a maybe more exposed uh, change is we now have support for filtered aggregates. Uh, basically, it just adds a clause uh, called filter to an aggregate. Now, who's ever written a query that did something like, you know, case where, you know, sum of case when this else null kind of a thing. It's kind of ugly, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to do that anymore. Now you can say something. If you look at this, you would select A, you do count star, it gives you a regular, and then you do a count star filter where B greater than 5. Well, that will count every row where B is greater than 5. So instead of a case when B greater than 5, then 1 else null end, you can just write filter. In the end, it runs it more or less the same way. Yes? Yes? You can filter on anything that's at that level of the query. I doubt it's going to be a big difference. Uh, it might be a small difference, but the, 
the performance of processing one of these case expressions that just turns it into one or null is very low. Uh, I doubt you're going to be able to measure a performance difference, really. It's mostly, it allows you, it's easier to write. It's a hell of a lot easier to read when you come back later. It actually tells you what you're doing. Those case expressions can be really hard to read when you come back later. Uh, the biggest change we have in the area of aggregates is we now have something called ordered set aggregates, uh, which is a whole new class of aggregates. It basically deals with the concept of an offset into group. Our traditional aggregates does some sort of a summary over a group, whereas the ordered set aggregates looks into the groups and looks at the offsets inside of the group, um, which you can get the keyword for using this is within group. Now, it also adds a feature called hypothetical aggregates. Some of these names are just awesome, aren't they? Hypothetical aggregates, that's brilliant. Uh, you know, maybe it's there. Uh, the easiest way to look at an ordered set aggregate is probably the mode aggregate, which returns the most common value in a group. Now, ordered set aggregates are by definition ordered, so you have to have an order by, even though something like calculating the most common value doesn't actually require an order by. But the syntax is you say mode, mode here is the aggregate. So instead of saying count star, you say mode within group. And then you define your group, which is, or your group order, which is order by B. So this will give you A, and for each A coming from the group by down here, it'll give you the most common value of B. Now I initially had no idea why the heck they would call it mode. And then someone told me, well, that's statistics. I don't know enough statistics, but it, mode is most common value. Uh, I'm sure someone knows why. Uh, <clears throat> there are some more interesting things that we can do with this. We can do percentile queries, finally. Uh, we got continuous and discrete percentile. Uh, takes a value that's uh, between 0 and 1. So this one tells you for each A, give me which value is 30% into the group. Uh, and of course, now we really need the order by B for the definition as well. Otherwise, well, in which order into the group? Uh, so this is not a fairly common thing we want to go look at. Like what's the percentile value at a certain level? Uh, the difference between the, the continuous and the discrete is whether you want an exact value that's the closest one, or if you want an interpolated value between where it would be if, if there's no exact value at 30%. Uh, these were things that were actually pretty hard to do before. You'd typically end up <coughs> using something like a window query to actually enumerate them all and then a where query at an outer layer uh, to get rid of them. This is obviously a lot more performant than that because it can actually sort of skip into the group to the point where you need. Now, the final version of the ordered set aggregates are the hypothetical aggregates, uh, which are awesome. Uh, they'll return hypothetical rows. So basically, they will return, well, what would it look like if I put something in here? But I'm not actually going to put it in here. So if I say rank 4, for example, that is, if I put the value 4 into my table, how far into the group would it appear? So if your table has, you know, 1, 2, 5, 6, it will return 3. It will end up in position 3. Or percent rank will tell you, well, if I put a 4 into this table, how many percent into the group would that value be? So obviously, it has to sort of fake a row and get the value back from that, thus the hypothetical part. Uh, so it'll get you a bunch of information further. And of course, these are, these are things you could do before, but they will be done much faster uh, than this because previously you had to get all the data out and somehow process it at an outer layer, whether in a, a CTE or in a stored procedure or even in your application. Uh, so it'll get you back to a lot of these. Now, leaving aggregates for a while, uh, we've also improved the concept of updatable views in a number of ways. Uh, we've had updatable views for a while, which means you, you, know, you create the view. It will automatically generate rules for you to be able to update the view, and it will update the underlying table. Uh, what's new in 9.4 is we can now do partially updatable views. So previously, as soon as we found anything in the view that we can't figure out where to go, say there was a join or, or an expression somewhere, then the whole view would not be updatable, and you'd have to go do it manually. Uh, now what we can do now is we can figure out that, oh, well, we can still safely update these three columns. It's only these two columns over here that are not safe to update. 
So we'll then generate the rules so that those columns will be updatable and the other columns won't be. Now you can still do as you've been able to do forever in Postgres. You can always write your own rules if you know how to update these remaining columns. We just can't auto detect them. But we will now be able to split apart saying we can do this but not that in the same view, uh, which should make it easier. Uh, we have another important improvement of updatable views, which is with check option. Updatable views currently uh, in Postgres will allow you to insert rows that you cannot see. So say you just have a view that says, you know, select star from my table where ID less than 10, and you insert the value 20. You can actually still insert this. It'll go in the table. And then you select back, and it's not in the view. So you don't see the row that you inserted. Uh, this is what with check option does. If you say with check option, <clears throat> you'll only be able to insert rows into that view that you would actually be able to see through the view. So if you try to insert the number 20 when your where clause was less than 10, it's going to block the insert with an error. But if you try to insert the value 5, it's going to go in fine, because that one would be visible back out through the view. Yes? Yeah, it's probably part of it is backwards compatibility. Uh, I think the with check option is actually SQL standard. Uh, so you're, the SQL standard says by default you are supposed to do performance thing. Like in a lot of cases, this may not be a problem at all. Uh, but if it is, you can use that. If you just say with check option, um, we will use what is called with check option cascade, which means we'll check everything. If you use with check option local, we'll only look at the current view. So if you have a view on top of another view, you can say, well, you only have to check the first level view. It may be that you know that as long as you check the first level view, you don't have to check the others. That's basically purely a performance optimization, saying, well, you don't have to go down the whole tree, look for everything, because you know, I know. And then it's your fault when your data is wrong. If you tell the system you know and you don't, then you know, all bets are off. Uh, we have some other small functions at this level that uh, are now available. We support a multi-argument unnest. Unnest is the function that will take an array and turn it into a row set or a result set. Uh, previously, you could only do one at a time. The, it becomes interesting when you're unnesting multiple arrays of different sizes. Then you'll end up with nulls in the other rows, of course. Uh, so just being able to put in multiple ones, it'll probably be a tiny performance improvement as well as so you actually have more than one, but the important thing is if you have them different sizes, they'll go in just fine. Uh, and we have a new keyword for this as well that will not work for just unnest, it'll work for any set returning function, which is with ordinality. Uh, so it's a very simple thing. For each row in this, normally if, if we use this query, you know, you'll get back a row of A and D and then a B and E, C, F, X, null, and Y, null. If you do this one, we'll return AD1, BE2, CF3. Yeah, I think you get the idea by now, right? So basically, we'll count the rows for you. Now, if what you need is to have a row counter in your application, this is probably not the right way of doing it. I'm sure your application is capable of counting rows, right? knowing how far into a result set it is. Sending that data back and forth is not very useful. But this can be useful if you're, for example, taking the result of this unnest here, or, or again, any other set returning function, and joining it with something. Now your data loses its ordering. But by doing this, you can put the ordering back and do maybe order by on the result value of this with ordinality clause. So you don't have to actually create a fake array with a bunch of numbers in it just to be able to sort by it. Uh, we'll generate those automatically for you. Um, anyone in here who has a system built with lots and lots of PLP GSQL functions? A couple of you? You can get a stack trace. You've never needed that, right? <laughs> it's one of those, if you're, not use, <laughs> if you're not using it, it's like, well, I don't care. But if you're using, if you have a system with lo large amounts, it becomes really, really useful to be able to get a stack trace of what's actually calling what and when and where. Um, it's very simple. You just uh, use the get diagnostic stack equals PG context. They'll just return the stack trace in text format, and then can, you can do whatever you want with it. In this example, we raise a notice. You can store it in a table. You can return it to the user. Um, it's just a text value once you reach that point. 
another one that you probably have heard of already, and that's going to be marketed into tiny little pieces, is JSONB. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about JSONB because there are so many other talks here that are going to talk to you about JSONB. Uh, <coughs> but uh, so, how many of you are actually using the Postgres JSON data type today in 9.3? Oh, at least a couple of you. See, a lot of people haven't even had the time to get to that. The JSON data type in 9.3 is basically just text. It is text that when you do an insert will validate that it's JSON. We don't do anything intelligent with it. Uh, JSONB parses the JSON data and stores it binary. It, it breaks it down into pieces, um, which means we can do interesting things with it. It does now support basic data typing. It knows about the basic JSON data types. It can separate a number from a string, uh, which we couldn't do before. Now, one important difference for your application, if you are basing your application on JSON today and you want to upgrade to JSONB, is that we no longer preserve key order. So the fields in your JSON document may come back in a different order. But they'll still be there and they'll still be semantically correct. And I believe someone did the check of like all the databases that do just JSON, like Mongo and things, and they all do this already. They don't preserve the key order. So we're just now doing what everybody else was doing. We were giving you an extra guarantee before uh, that we have now removed. But as long as you do that, you can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, how many have been using HStore? OK, so in a way, you can say that JSON is HStore with more features and a different interface. But the general idea, it's, it supports HStore style indexes with nested structure support. Uh, so you can do lots of queries, uh, like this one here, for example. This is the JSONB containment operator that says, you know, give me any document that has uh, some key set to some value, another key set to other value, and ignore the rest of the document. We're querying in on just these keys. And this will be a fully indexed gin-based lookup, and not just you know, a sequential scan. And you don't have to uh, do as some you would have to do in 9.3, uh, is you'd have to create an index for every single key you wanted to search for. This will create one index for everything. So in that way, uh, you can say 9.3 works like Mongo, and 9.4 is better, where you have to create one index for every key. Uh, and of course, the interesting thing here is do this together with pack gen indexes. Any querying you're doing on JSON will be ridiculously much faster than it was in 9.3. And as you heard from uh, Mark earlier, yeah, the benchmarks that people are running are at least in the benchmarks showing that it's significantly faster than Mongo, which do more or less just that. Of course, you'll have to benchmark your own application to see what actually happens there if you're considering moving something from Mongo to Postgres. But it's so much faster that it may now be viable to do that. Whereas in 9.3, you could do it, but you'd lose performance. Uh, over Mongo in general, or over a lot of other ways of doing it as well. So let's move for a short moment over to the more infrastructure features. Uh, how many in here has ever written a Postgres background worker? Oh, actually at least one person, more than the people I know personally, <laughs> uh, who, more than the people who are you know, Postgres committers. Uh, <coughs> 9.3 got background workers. 9.4 gets something called dynamic background workers. Uh, the only real difference is in 9.3, anything you wrote as a background worker would start along with Postgres. If you wanted to make any changes to it, you had to restart everything. Uh, in 9.3, they can be started dynamically. This is not something that Postgres itself really uses. Uh, it's very similar to how AutoVacuum works, except AutoVacuum doesn't use this infrastructure yet. Uh, but it's the same way that the AutoVacuum Launcher could be considered one of the old static background workers, which can then launch new ones. Now, this is supposed to become, or already is becoming, the foundation of the work to look at things like parallel query, things where we need to start and stop things dynamically on the system. But right now, it's just pure infrastructure. But if you have built your own extensions that need to run things alongside of Postgres, inside of the Postgres system, uh, dynamic background workers will make that a lot easier. Uh, sort of coupled with that, we also have something called dynamic shared memory, uh, which is that shared memory can now be allocated when it's actually needed. Everything doesn't have to be allocated on startup. Now, unfortunately, that does not include shared buffers, right? You all hope that this meant you could change shared buffers and not restart, but no. Shared buffers will still require a restart. Uh, <clears throat> but for ex it's typically intended for things like background workers, where you need to temporarily allocate some memory share it between a number of different processes in the system, and then get rid of it. We try not to get rid of shared buffers that way. 
And there are other reasons why we can't do it with that one. There is even a lightweight message queuing system built on top of this. So you have a built-in message queue between Postgres backend servers. Typically used from, say, your regular Postgres connection to talk to one of these background workers. We need a cheap way to do that, and a shared memory-based message queue is very good for that. Again, these are mainly useful for you if you are building these server-side extensions. Uh, something that might be more efficient or, or more visible at the early point is we now have MVCC catalog access. So how many people actually know what snapshot now means? Okay, how many of you knew it existed? Because you've seen it in an error message. Okay, so uh, as you know, Postgres is an MVCC system, the multi-version concurrency control, which is how we do locking between uh, processes, making sure that you can only see the things that are not committed and things like that. And everything in the system used that except for the system itself. So the internal system catalogs, things like PG class or, or PG attribute, accessing all of these used a different semantic called snapshot now, which worked, but it was different, and it was really easy to get it wrong. Uh, so the main reason to remove it, I think, originally was to create simpler and more robust code. We've been talking about removing it for years, and everyone just assumed that everything would be so much slower that we couldn't do it. Uh, and then Robert ended up doing it, and it turns out it wasn't slower. Uh, but the idea is we now the system works exactly the same way as everything else. This can lay uh, foundation for doing more things like uh, even more changes around decreasing locking requirements and things like that. We now have access to that. Now the thing that, the way that you might notice this is that this will intentionally break extensions. If you've installed any extensions that are actually using Snapshot now because they're directly accessing the system catalogs, they will break because they're using a symbol in the header files that doesn't exist anymore. And again, that's intentional because the way the system works around this has been changed. There are still ways to use this access method. It's just you have to explicitly make that choice. Again, the way that most of you are going to find this is because something that used to work doesn't build anymore and someone else built it for you. So you have to go talk to them and say, hey, please update to Postgres 9.4. Uh, but uh, other than that, it's going to be transparent. Another big thing we have on the infrastructure side is the logical change set extraction. This is the foundation for the BDR project that Simon's talked about, these new replication solutions. Uh, I've seen a lot of interesting examples of things you can do with logical change extraction. Uh, people have built auditing solutions. Someone built a message queue. Uh, the idea is the Postgres transaction log today contains the binary changes to disk. Right? It basically says, you know, take this piece of a disk block over here and change it to this. And if we crash, we replay that and all that stuff. We don't actually contain any SQL. There's no way today to go into the while and see, well, someone ran an update statement. What was actually changed? Or what was the update statement? Logical change sets will still not give you the SQL command, but it'll give you the logical changes. So it'll tell you, well, yeah, you're going to go change this disk block over here, but that also means you're going to update the row in this table to now have the value 5. And this data can then be extracted through a plugin-based system and used by things like the bidirectional replication to extract and replay this somewhere else. The logical change set extraction itself is probably not something most of you are ever going to use, but you're going to use the products that are built on top of it. Yes? It will store more. Uh, which is why it'll be a new while level that you can set. You set you have while level uh, minimal, archive, hot standby, and now also logical. It's on top of it that adds more data. So yes, it will give you more data in your transaction log. It'll only give you more data. It won't give you more syncs. But it will definitely increase the size of your logs. Yes? Yes, yes. You'll have a choice. If you don't want it, don't turn it on. It will not be turned on by default. Uh, we've added something called replication slots, which will hopefully finally fix the problem of your standby getting behind and dying. Uh, as you know today, if you're using streaming replication, if you don't set while keep segments and you run something with heavy updates on your master, for example, your slave might lose track and fall behind and just die. Uh, you can use log archiving to get around that, but what replication slots is a way to do this in streaming only situations where basically when your slave connects, it can use a replication slot and say, this is how far I've seen. And as, until that slot is either removed or the slave is caught up, transaction log prior to this 
timestamp will not be deleted. But you don't have to set while keep segments to 5,000 and waste a lot of disk space because it will now only be actually kept if it's needed for that thing. It was originally developed just for logical replication where it's absolutely required. Uh, but you can use it for physical replication, you can use it for your base backups, you can use it for anything uh, over the replication protocol. So a couple of things on the DBA and administration side. How many of you are using materialized view in 9.3? Two of you? How many of you would like to use materialized view in 9.3 but they suck? Sorry, Kevin. <laughs> Uh, there's a big thing that I've, I've personally found. I really wanted to use them and they suck uh, because they lock when you do a refresh. Uh, they take an exclusive lock when you do a refresh and the sort of the whole point of running a materialized view tends to be that the query behind it is slow. So they lock for a long time. Uh, this is now fixed in 9.4. Now you can now say refresh materialized view concurrently and magically everything is fine. And they become a lot more useful. Now to make this work you need to have a unique index on the view. But that turns out to be in a lot of scenarios that makes a lot of sense for other reasons as well. Uh, so personally I found it to be in a position that, you know, 9.3 had the materialized views. They were nice in theory but you couldn't really use them in a lot of cases where you really needed them. Uh, and that's all changed now. They've become a lot more useful with this. With just this one single little keyword. I'm not sure why Kevin didn't add that keyword in the first place. It can't have been that hard. Oh uh, yeah, I guess there is that. <laughs> you should have just done it all for 9.2. I think that's the real way of doing it. Uh, small changes that if you're doing a lot of work with them will come in handy. You can now move everything in a table space at once. If you're decommissioning a table space, you don't have to manually loop through everything and say, oh, I'm going to move this table and this index and this view. You can just say alter table space, move everything over to this other place. Depends on how much data you have. And how fast your disks are. We still have to move it. The actual move operation is the same as before. Uh, but uh, it does uh, save a lot of typing and a lot of looping. Yes. Yep. Again, same way as, uh, as it would if you just did alter table space move. Uh, sorry, alter table move is what you do then uh, to put it to another table space. Uh, yep. It moves them sequentially. So if you want, if you want to move them concurrently, you have to write your own thing that runs the actual move commands in, in uh, parallel. Small utility in contrib called PG Prewarm helps helps you prewarm your cache. Uh, it's an extension gives you PG Prewarm where you can just say, you know, take this table over here and load it all into memory so that I'm ready, for example, before you do a failover on a cluster uh, into a replication slave, PG Prewarm. If you're interested in something like PG Prewarm, you should also look at the extension on PGXN called PGF in core. Uh, it's a little bit more operating system specific. I used to say it works on everything except Windows, and then someone told me now it works on Windows, so I'm not really sure what it doesn't work on. It's a more complicated tool, but it's also a much more capable tool. PG Prewarm is the simple tool that will just work for the simple scenarios. So you can go ahead and say, you know, this table I want it to be in shared buffers. And it will be in shared buffers. And then it'll go out of shared buffers pretty quickly, but it'll be there for a second. We got something called Gin Compressed Posting Lists. It's a beautiful name, right? Helped everybody. Uh, it's basically an internal change to the Gin disk format, the Gin index disk format. Uh, that has become a lot more efficient. Uh, each entry in GIN contains what's basically an array of pointers. Uh, that is, you know, page number and offset into that page saying, well, this thing you found in the index exists on these different pages in the database. Uh, they're now stored as, well, it exists here and then it exists this much further ahead from the previous one and this much further ahead from the previous one thing. And that has allowed us to decrease the size of this pointer from 90 bytes to 21. Uh, which is a pretty good improvement. It tends to lead up, in, if you were in the bad position previously where it paid uh, the highest cost, you can get indexes that are six times smaller. And obviously that means six times less use of your cache for the same data. So this can lead to really big speed ups in GIN scans if you are in the scenario where you have a lot of those things. We also have something called GIN indexed fast scan, which is a new way of, yes? Uh, 
Yes. Yes, it is. It will upgrade the Jin pages live one by one. So the code will read both the old and the new version. Um, Jin index fast scan is a smarter scan order of these posting lists. It's basically since Jin supports its own and and or queries, more or less. You, you know, you do a full text search, it'll search for multiple words in one scan. Uh, and what we did before was we just randomly picked whatever happens to be first and then do an and later. What we do now is we intentionally start with whichever list is smallest if we're doing an and scan. Because then we can do a skip scan of the other lists. And we want to be sure we start with the smallest one. It sounds a lot easier than the code looked. Uh, the idea is if you have a query that is common and rare, so you have a common key and a rare key in the same search, for example, in your full text search or in an array search or in a JSON search, it'll be much faster because we only scan the short list completely now. On the configuration side, you can now say alter system set and change config parameters permanently. We can argue over beer later whether this is a good idea or not. But you get to choose if you want to use it. Uh, and once you've changed it, you can use the function that already existed called pgreload.conf and it'll actually reload your configuration and you can now change everything through SQL. Again, whether it's good or bad can be argued. Uh, there are also things we have to think about when we do this. Uh, first of all, the variables for this are stored in a separate config file uh, that by default overrides what's in postgres.conf. If you don't like it, you can just turn that off. But then people can go ahead and do the alter system set as much as they like and nothing's going to happen. You still have to do a reload, which means you can end up in very interesting situations. You can do an alter system set. It will verify that you get a valid value. You have a question? Yes, it does. It, it's an include of that file. Um, so you can end up in a position where you change a very, uh, it will verify that the value is correct, but if you have interdependencies between values, you can actually end up with a configuration that doesn't reload. Uh, and you can also end up finding interesting bugs in other people's code, which I did when I went for do an example of this. Um, turns out the effective cache size just didn't work uh, when you set it to interesting numbers. And also, contexts still apply. So you can go in and say, alter system set shared buffers to four terabytes. That'll work just fine. Now go ahead and try to restart your database, which you cannot do from SQL. And shared buffers doesn't change on the reload. So these are things you have to really think about. Uh, probably in a lot of cases, you want to limit which parameters you want to be setting through alter system set. It is still a super user only parameter, so, you know, it's not that easy to kill the system. Uh, but there are use cases for it. There are also some pretty severe pitfalls that you can get into by doing it. Uh, a couple of interesting new config parameters. Auto vacuum work mem. Previously, we've used maintenance work mem to configure how much memory auto vacuum uses, uh, which means by default the system is configured to use three times maintenance work mem. These are typically very different values, actually, because auto vacuum runs in parallel and maintenance work mem is designed to control something that doesn't run in parallel. This is just a separate parameter that will let you control that. The default value is minus one for auto vacuum work mem, which means use maintenance work mem. So if you don't do anything, nothing changed. But it gives you another knob if you need it. We have a new parameter called session preload libraries because we didn't think we had enough ways of loading libraries with just two of them. Uh, so now we have a third one. We had shared preload libraries, which loaded libraries when the system starts, and you couldn't change it. We still have that. Then we had local preload libraries, which loaded libraries in each backend as they started, but they had to be stored in a plugins directory. Well, now we have session preload libraries, which will load them when the backend starts, but they don't have to be stored in the plugins directory anymore. The plugins directory, by the way, which is not supported by the official way of building extensions. You have to move files around manually for that. Local preload libraries was always a little bit weird. Uh, this one is a lot less weird. Uh, we have a parameter called while log hints, uh, which will let us log hint bit changes to while. I'm sure that made everyone a lot more certain of what this means. Uh, in general, uh, it's required for things like rewind tools if you're not using checksums. How many are actually using checksums? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's pretty much no one. Yeah, 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 you and your ZFS. <laughs> it is required for rewind tools for that. Uh, 
it also can help you if you turn this on, because this is something you can change on the fly. It'll give you a hint of how much bigger is your while going to be if you actually turn on checksums. So you can turn this on on a testing system to measure that. Uh, we got some updates to PG stat statements. It now exposes the query ID, something some of us have been asking for for years. Certain people have been blocking because they thought it was a bad idea. Now this is just an internal hash value that's based on the parse tree, which means it's not stable across versions. It is not stable across platforms. It is not even stable across all schema modifications. But it makes it possible for you to uniquely identify query without looking at the whole query text and across sessions. The typical thing would be if something falls out of the top list and then comes back in, you can still see that it is the same thing. Just used internally in pgstat statements doesn't really help you, but if you're archiving or snapshotting pgstat statements into a different table, getting the query ID in there is really helpful. So you can then analyze things over time. Uh, I'm running a bit slow on time, so I'm going to go into uh, the final part, which is replication and recovery features, uh, which of course, there have been a lot more than the ones mentioned. Uh, but speaking of time, uh, we have support for time-delayed standbys now. Uh, we used to be able to do this using file-based replication. Now we can do it over streaming. We can basically just say, this standby slave over here is going to be 30 minutes behind the master at all times. That gives you 30 minutes if you have a disaster on the master. You can get 30 minutes to stop the replication, figure out exactly how far to go, and replay just that part instead of having to go back to your backups and start over from scratch and replay a lot of data. Uh, now what we do is we still actually replay the whole thing, except for the commit record. So it won't delay you by a lot of things. The timing is reasonably exact, because the only thing it needs is the commit record. Everything else will still be in there. Uh, the main reason for that is, of course, the commit record is the only one that actually has a timestamp in it. Uh, so it, we need that one. Uh, it is done very simple. You go into your recovery conf and just say min recovery apply delay equals 30 minutes or, or whatever you want. You can, of course, configure a different delay for each individual once of your standbys if you have multiple ones. Um, small improvements on the backup side. You can finally relocate table spaces when you do a PG base backup. So you can do PG base backup from here to here, but this table space that used to be stored in this directory is now going to be stored in this other directory. You could do that as an inline operation with your backup. You could do it previously, do the backup, move the files, change the sim link. Now it does it internally. And we have a new statistics view in the system called PG Stat Archiver, which will tell you information about your log archiver. What's the last file that was archived to your server? When was it archived? Things you previously had to, you know, troll your log files and try to analyze it in. It'll now do that one internally. So as always, there'll always be more things, right? There's lots of smaller fixes. There are always performance improvements. I see Simon isn't actually in the room, or I'd say there's something about locking, because he gives me hell every time he sees this presentation that I didn't include his, um, his feature, but that's okay. We can't mention them all. There are a lot of things. You can go to the release notes. They'll tell you most of it. You have to go to the commit log to see everything, but the release notes will tell you most of the things that you're actually interested in. Uh, I try to usually pick up one of those tiny features in each version that turns out to, if you're actually hit by it, it's really useful. Dynamic library loading has now switched to be logged to debug one. So who has ever installed Postgres on Windows here? That's a couple of you. Were you really annoyed by the fact that every time someone connects to your database, it tells you that it loaded the PL debugger? Yep. Every single time someone connects, it would log, yay, I loaded the debugger. Yes, the debugger is loaded. Oh, I've loaded the debugger. If you have a lot of connections, that would lead to you know, millions of lines of log every day. This is now logged as debug one. <laughs> you can turn it on if you want, but probably you don't. It's one of those small things. If it's causing you a problem, then this will really help you. Otherwise, you just don't care. And of course, then we have one of those, like, now just because we're Postgres, we will now support date parsing of years <laughs> with more than five digits <laughs> in non-standard formats. <laughs> of course, if you use the standard ISO format, we already supported this. right? But for these weird things like American formats and stuff like that, we now support that as well. You know, because we're Postgres and we like to do it right. So that's what I had. Please download the beta version. Please test it. Run your tests against it. And let us know how it works out. Any further questions? Yes? Well, 
I expect to be a while before current timestamp will return a five-digit year. Requirements to store five-digit years obviously already exist with things like astronomy and stuff like that. They do think far ahead. I think we still believe that the Earth is still going to be around at that time. Whether we are around is a whole different story as, as humanity, but the planet's going to be around. Yes? So whether 9.5 will be an online upgrade, uh, we don't know. There are certainly hopes for it. Uh, there are hopes to be able to build something on top of the unidirectional logical replication, but it's too early to tell. Um, we don't know that for sure yet. There are people working on it. Yes? The, the idea behind JSONB is you don't have to do that. You create a single index which support complex queries. So in previous versions, you had to create multiple indexes and complicated indexes, functional-based indexes. Now you create one. And instead, so for example, let me find the JSONB slide, which is somewhere back here, I think. Let me know if I pass it. There we go. So this, this query here, to do that one previously, you would have to create two indexes. Right, one on some key and one on other key, and then you'd have to do an AND query. But this one is served by a single index. And you can do like subtree searches into the JSON as well with this one single index. So not being required to do that is one of the big features about JSONB. Yes? So the, 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 you're referring to the logical change set extraction thing? Yeah. Well, can that be switched to So you can do, you mean things like you'd use it for auditing and things like that? Yeah. Uh, yes, there are people who've done already example plugins that do auditing through the logical change set extraction. The change set extraction part, I'd say, is definitely robust. The plugins are maybe not quite finished yet. But they're just extensions, so they can keep developing externally. So yeah, I think building on top of that to build that is, is definitely something where the infrastructure and the foundation is now in place. OK, well, I think we're also pretty much out of time. So I have one minute left. Well, then you get no more questions. Thank you very much.